Hello, my name is Mike Smith. I'm from the New Zealand Fabian Society, mm. and it's my great pleasure today to interview uh, Ambassador Wang Xiaolong from the People's Republic of China to talk with us about China's values and what China values. Um, I heard Ambassador Wang speak at a uh, meet meeting convened by the Institute of Industrial Relations last year, and in the course of that meeting he did address the question of China's values and said, China's choice for values, social system and path to modernity <coughs> is made by our own people based on our own history, culture and realities. All these choices have proven to be suitable and effective to solve China's problems and meet the needs of the Chinese people. So, Ambassador, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview and thank you very much for coming to explain to us um, China's values in more detail than, than uh, you were able to in that uh, address to the Institute of Industrial Relations. But, but before we do that, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from in China, where you grew up, where you were educated, mm -hmm. what you've done in your mm -hmm. life, where you've been, mm -hmm. what your own personal interests are, so we get a bit of a feel for your own mm. uh, situation. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Smith, for the opportunity to share my thoughts and perspectives on China's values. Because uh, as I explained when we had this chit chat uh, before it actually started, uh, this is uh, an opportunity to share uh, with uh, whoever is interested some of the underlying logic uh, mm -hmm. behind what we do both domestically and uh, in our external relationship. And uh, as for me, myself. Uh, I was uh, I was born in Tianjin, um, okay, one of the yeah. major cities. Been there. I grew up mostly in Beijing, mm. and uh, went to university there. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, my career has been with the Foreign Service, uh, uh, with some uh, postings uh, in uh, New York, Singapore, Mongolia, and now. Finally, I'm here in New Zealand. Actually, I had my first encounters with New Zealand uh, back in 1999, when, okay. when New Zealand played host to um, uh, the APAC summit uh, yeah. meeting for the first time around. Yeah. So my responsibility at, this, at the time took me uh, quite a number of times to your beautiful country. And uh, I, I was thinking to myself at the time that maybe I could come back uh, for one of the postings uh, in my career. But mm. I didn't know at the time that one day I would come back as ambassador, but here mm. I am. Well, it certainly is a beautiful country, and I, I see from your Twitter um, account that you're a hiker. So uh, have you done any hiking in New Zealand in our beautiful country or other well, places yes. you've been? Yeah, right. Uh, I enjoy hiking on, on weekends whenever yeah. weather permits, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, uh, mostly uh, around uh, uh, the greater Wellington yeah. region. Yeah. So you haven't uh, been to conquer uh, Mount Cook yet or anything like that? Do you have Not any yet. other ambitions to, to go a bit further afield, or I suppose you're fairly busy? So. Uh, hopefully, yes, uh, hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Particularly when I'm joined by my family, so that oh, yeah. we can share the experience. Yeah. Is your family here with you at the moment? No, not yet. But they will be coming. But they will be oh. coming at oh, least for visits. Yeah, yeah, good. Well done. Mm. Okay. Well, getting on to the issue that we mm. were we were want to talk about. Mm. Um, news, news, um, China has existed as a country for thousands of years. I mean, it, it, depending on how you count, it's mm. 2,000 years or 5,000 years, but mm. it's, it's extraordinary that it is such a large country and has mm. been such a distinct entity, political entity, for mm. a, a long, long time, which mm. I don't think it, many other places have been. Mm. Um, and it has its own cultural icons such as Confucius and systems such as the examination-based Mandarin. Mm that may not be well understood in the West. So how would you describe for our audience China's values that derive mm. from its traditional culture? Mm. And what is meant by China's civilizational mm. culture? Mm. Maybe I can, if you allow me, uh, start by talking about values, the role 
they play uh, in a society or country, mm. uh, and then mm. uh, yeah, more sure. generally, Go and ahead. then come to uh, um, uh, China's values, so mm. to speak, uh, because values are important uh, to uh, any country or society. Very an essential part of the bonds that would help to keep it together as a cohesive mm. whole, uh, shaping uh, its um, political, economic, and social systems, and. Mm also informing its policies, both domestic and foreign. Uh, as I explained in my speech uh, at the NZIA, the values of a country is the product or uh, function of uh, the circumstances, uh, including its culture, its history, and other aspects mm -hmm. of its realities. As the, as the circumstances of different countries are different, so it's no surprise that the values of different countries might be different as well. Mm. And, and like it or not, um, as we see it, uh, this, is, this diversity uh, uh, in terms of the values among the different countries is a fact of life of our world. And uh, it not only makes um, our world more interesting, if we can treat each other with mutual respect and uh, see the different values systems as equals rather than assuming that mm -hmm. one is necessarily superior to the other. Mm -hmm. And we can, if we can keep an open mind, ready to appreciate and learn from one another, such diversity might be a source of strength uh, and an important driver for innovation and progress. Uh, in the case of China, uh, our values are shaped, again, by our history, our culture, and uh, uh, let me give you some examples uh, of um, the values we hold dear uh, in China. For example, we, we, we believe, or at least most of us believe, uh, in the pursuit of the common or greater good uh, for the society. And we always believe that the collective would come before uh, the individuals. But at the same time, we believe in the responsibility of the individuals. And on the basis of, um, on the basis of constant self-improvement, if you can speak Chinese, uh, you, you know uh, there's a saying in, in Chinese, Jun zi bu xi. So on the, on, the, on the basis of that constant self-improvement, uh, the, indiv in the individuals would have responsibilities to contribute uh, to their families and, and on that basis uh, to the wider community as well. And uh, we also uh, believe um, in uh, the value of unity uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation and as a, as a state. And uh, uh, dating back to the Confucius years, almost mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, yeah, uh, we, we have been believing in putting people first, seeing people as the most important source of power and legitimacy for the state. Mm. And we also believe uh, uh, in the harmony between uh, nature and, and humanity. And you mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the examination-based uh, mm. uh, measuring it. Actually, that's the system that has been un underpinning the officialdom uh, of uh, the Chinese society uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, so that is based on the belief in meritocracy and, and self-improvement again, uh, and also the value of education for all mm -hmm. uh, as, as an equalizer. Uh, and uh, on another level, we, uh, we believe in, in, in good faith, and friendliness uh, among neighbors, and we also value the paramount importance of peace. Um, and uh, um, in terms of how we conduct uh, our relationships, uh, both at the human level, but also um, uh, in between states, uh, we have always believed in uh, the importance to ensure that we don't do to others uh, what we don't want others to to us. So these... Well, that's, that's uh, the uh, Christian ideal, so there's a connection. 
Right, there's the connection. That was actually uh, one of uh, the teachings from Confucius himself. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. What date was Confucius then? What, what were his dates? Uh, that was more than 2,000 years ago. Okay. Yeah, right. I wonder where. Yeah, yeah, that's about the same time when Christianity was born. May have been some right. transfer, right. possibly. <laughs> <laughs> and we pride ourselves on, on these values as they define what and who we are as mm -hmm. both individuals and as a nation. And we'll be more than happy to um, share our values, our thoughts, our perspectives uh, with whoever is interested. But just as we hate to be preached to, uh, mm -hmm. or, 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 or we, we, we don't want others to to impose their values upon us. We shall never use our own values as yardsticks to judge others. Try to preach to others or try to impose, or even worse, try to impose our values upon mm. them. So this is our... Well, that was one of the takeaways I took from your speech, actually, mm -hmm. that, that um, making that point that you have your own values which are mm. based on your history and culture and tradition, mm. and I think mm. You know, that's a great summary of the, the, the importance of the collective, the importance of self-improvement, mm -hmm. the importance of looking after others, the importance of family. That, that's, those, are, those, are, those are values that I think um, some, well, uh, all of us can aspire to, mm. uh, but the, there, are, there are certainly nuances. But the, the point I think that I did take away was that you, you, you saw you, you were proud of China's values, mm. so, so, and, and the Chinese people are, but you don't see them necessarily as uh, the values for other cultures to mm. uh, adopt or, mm. or whatever, mm. but, but to, to understand and to, and, to, uh, and to look for points of common, uh, commonality mm. where we can share mm. some of those values. Yeah. Because, yeah, we, we pride ourselves on our um, value-based system, but mm. we have in this country, you know, uh, Pākehā liberal values and Māori whānau-based values mm. that, are, that are different. Mm. And what's happening here mm. is we're learning from each mm. other. Uh, and building something that, mm. that is bigger than all of us. So mm. perhaps if we could just move to some of the ways in which in China's history mm. those values have been expressed, and I think particularly of the um, the uh, ending of extreme poverty and the bringing of 800 million people out of mm. poverty. And mm. it seems to me that, that that's one of humanity's great achievements. Mm. And, and I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about how that developed and how mm. it was actually achieved what 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 did mm. china do to mm. actually bring that about mm. Mm. you may have noticed that uh, uh, because we we held our 20th party congress uh, last october and in the report issued by the party congress we identified what we call the chinese path to modernization and one of the defining features of that chinese path and actually, it's also one of the defining features of uh, what we call the socialism with Chinese characteristics, mm. is common prosperity. And what it means uh, essentially mm. uh, is that growth and development should be broad-based and inclusive, and uh, the benefits uh, of uh, that growth and development should be enjoyed by all members of the society rather than uh, only a small minority, uh, and that is uh, what it is. In terms of what it isn't, is um, the common prosperity is not uh, egalitarianism, because we've been there before, and it's not a very successful experience. And um, uh, it, common prosperity uh, will not uh, take place overnight. Uh, and it can only be achieved over a long historical process. So it's very clear to us that the immediate priority uh, uh, as a government, as a country, is to grow the economy uh, so that we can, so to speak, make the cake bigger. 
as we explore ways to cut it better as well mm -hmm. through uh, social and redistribu redistributional policies. We encourage uh, people to get rich, of course, through legal means, uh, by incentivizing or rewarding hard work, initiative, and creativity. But at the same time, we would also encourage those individuals and businesses that have thriven uh, to fulfill their social responsibilities and help uh, with others to get ahead as well. Mm. And uh, uh, at the government level, uh, we have put in place uh, uh, broad-based social safety nets and also uh, 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 established mechanisms for the provision of basic social services like uh, education, mm -hmm. again as the equalizer, mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. Uh, facilitate social upward social mm -hmm. mobility mm -hmm. uh, and and healthcare and mm -hmm. uh, basic uh, basic housing mm -hmm. and an important part of the effort for common prosperity would be what you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, um, poverty reduction mm -hmm. uh, uh, over the years um, and um, I think you're right. Uh, we have perhaps um, conducted one of the biggest, arguably, um, poverty reduction program uh, in human history, uh, which has uh, lifted nearly a hundred, no, one billion actually, mm, one okay. billion people out of extreme yeah, or yeah. absolute poverty. Um, and uh, uh, Many studies have been conducted on how we actually manage that uh, because apparently China has succeeded uh, where some of the other countries have not been uh, mm -hmm. as successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because we, uh, just before we celebrated the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to proclaim that uh, we have uh, uh, can definitively solve the problem of absolute poverty in China. And uh, uh, a series of studies were carried out on how uh, mm -hmm. we, we did that. So uh, one of the basic ingredients for the recipe for our success story would be political commitment. There's no country whose political class, particularly uh, the leadership, uh, is as committed as, as China. Well, yeah. it, one of the um, great, well, in, in my readings about that, mm. the, the, one of the things that stood out for me is how it was about achievement, and it was about achievement through political c commitment. So, for example, party cadres were sent into all of the... Indeed. Uh, all Indeed. over the, to find right. the people who yeah. were in, in that situation right. and bring them to the opportunities of... So, and, and, so, and, and that, that, I think, is, is, for me, an important um, part of how I see China. It actually aims at achieving what it sets out to do. And, um, so I wonder that the again for me the I've always thought that if the world's um, environmental right. and uh, problems were to be solved, China would be uh, a crucial part of achieving the sorts of change that we would mm. all like to see. So I wonder what 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 are the ways in which China is looking to address the environmental uh, concerns and issues and climate change and mm. so on. Mm. Uh, let me start with, again, uh, with uh, what happens uh, at the conceptual level. Uh, because uh, how, as I uh, uh, briefly discussed uh, when we talked about mm. values yep, yep, yep. earlier in our conversation, I touched on the importance we attach to um, the harmony between yes. nature and humanity. That is a fundamental belief we hold. And uh, in, 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 in modern days, uh, the, uh, uh, the environmental values of China, or what we call um, the, the concept for ecological uh, civilization, 
uh, can be best summarized as uh, what we call the two mountains theory, uh, which was first espoused by uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping when he was the party secretary in Zhejiang province. Mm. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, the two mountains theories are uh, the very simple. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's about uh, the green mountains and clear waters are gold and silver mountains. Mm. So it, essentially, uh, it means that we need to integrate uh, ecological and environmental protection on, that, on one hand, and, uh, and uh, economic and social development on the other. Uh, and uh, we have, over the years, uh, I think not only uh, talk the talk, but also walk the walk, uh, by uh, 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 taking measures to uh, realize the transition towards a cleaner, greener, and lower carbon development. Uh, let me also give you some examples. Uh, we have carried out probably the biggest uh, tree planting program in this world. Mm. So in a typical year, uh, over a quarter of the new forest cover uh, globally would be found in China. Mm. And in that process, we have largely regreened the less plateau, which mm. has been lying bare and barren for over hundreds of I've years. I've been to the Lewis Plateau and I've right. seen some of the cave dwelling uh, right. yeah, people in, yeah, and lifted no, up right. onto the top. Indeed, yeah. 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 indeed, indeed. So that occurred as a result of, uh, mm. uh, of uh, environmental uh, degradation mm. over hundreds of years. Mm. But I think we've managed to reverse a uh, large mm. part of that process mm. Mm. Um, by re-greening uh, mm. a lot of those areas. And uh, uh, and in terms of uh, the the changes, uh, for example, in the in, in the energy mix, uh, we have we have reduced um, the proportion of coal in our primary energy uh, mm -hmm. structure uh, from its peak of over seventy two percent to the current fifty six percent. So that's a reduction mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. a whopping fifteen percentage points, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, and we have also, as we speak, uh, raised uh, the proportion of uh, clean energy uh, in the overall uh, energy uh, yeah. consumption to over 25 percent. And um, uh, in terms of um, the renewable power generation, the installed capacity by 2021, if I remember correctly, has already reached uh, over 1,000 gigawatts. Mm. Uh, meaning it's about roughly mm. more than a hundred times mm. of the entire installed power generating capacity of New Zealand. Mm. Mm. So uh, we are making steady progress. So yes. that puts us on track uh, towards uh, uh, achieving or fulfilling our commitment on uh, mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Peak CO2 emissions by 2030 yeah. and carbon neutrality by 2060. Okay, mm. so let's. Well, thank you for that. And we, 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 we should talk perhaps about some of the other uh, more general values. And mm. I'm thinking particularly of democracy, important value in Western culture. Mm -hmm. And the recent Congress report that you mentioned spoke of improving mm. the social governance system and whole process democracy. And I just wondered. What does that mean and how is it expressed and how mm. does it work? I mean, we, my, my wife has seen examples of what I imagine it means in, in, in people um, wanting change in, in a city of like Shaman in, mm. in past mm. years, for example. And how does it work inside the, the, the Communist Party, for example, in the development of China's five-year plans? Mm. Mm. So democracy is an indeed an important value, but I might suggest that uh, is, is not unique to the West. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's a major element in what we call the common values shared by the entire humanity. But indeed, uh, uh, it's true that democracy may take multiple forms. Uh, there's simply no uniform formula uh, that would fit all countries as the way a democracy is manifested in a specific country is the result again of choices made by its own people on the basis of its own uh, national realities. 
even, I would say, even among Western countries, uh, the way democracy functions uh, may vary from one country to another. Uh, in the case of China, uh, you're right, uh, we characterize our version of democracy as the whole process people's democracy, uh, which is a combination of uh, direct uh, democracy and indirect democracy, uh, and a combination of process-oriented procedural democracy and uh, uh, result-oriented substantive democracy. It is also a, a, a combination of electoral uh, democracy and, and consultative democracy. Uh, two cases uh, in point uh, would be the National People's Congress and the Chinese uh, uh, People's Political Consultative Conference, uh, which have just uh, mm. concluded their Two annual twin sessions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these two are the central arms in the architecture for uh, Chinese democracy at work. Uh, the NPC uh, is the highest organ of state power. Uh, its um, deputies uh, are elected through a process uh, of uh, a combination, again, of direct and indirect elections. Because uh, uh, we, the, the voters will uh, elect directly um, the deputies up to the county level. And beyond the county level, uh, the, the deputies of uh, lower level uh, People's Congress would elect the deputies mm. uh, for the Congress at a higher level, up to the national level. Mm. And the National People's Congress has very broad powers. Uh, it uh, makes the law of the land, uh, appoints and elects the uh, major officers of, uh, of the state, Mm -hmm. uh, including the president and, and the premier, and uh, it uh, uh, it uh, 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 makes major decisions, uh, uh, including by adopting uh, the national plans for our economic and social development and 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 and, and the annual state budget. It also exercises uh, oversight over the functioning of the government and the judiciary. Uh, and another arm would be the CPPCC, uh, uh, which is a major platform for uh, dialogue, uh, cooperation, and consultation between the Communist Party and other political oh, parties mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. which have a, unlike some of the other countries, which have a collaborative rather than a competitive relationship. But these two institutions, together with some of the other processes, are in place to make sure that uh, the Chinese people can exercise their democratic rights in an in a effective, substantive, and continuous manner. Meaning that, uh, 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 for example, the, the CPPCC, uh, they carry out broad consultations on all the major legislative and policy mm -hmm. issues. So these will help uh, to ensure that um, democracy won't stop or, or go into hibernation with the conclusion of elections. Well, I must imagine, I must confess, sorry, that uh, I imagine, I remember when we went to Beijing to meet the Communist Party, um, the, the Vice Minister asked us, told us we, we were wanting to meet, talk about party building. Mm. and. Um, I thought the Communist Party has 90 million members and we don't have anywhere near that. But we did have a, a uh, I, I did think they wanted to learn about our ways of doing uh, party behaviour. And I imagine inside 90 million members, mm. there's a great deal of discussion and dialogue and debate. Indeed. And, and, and probably, I imagine, focus on effective outcomes mm. that, 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 <laughs> that would be my expectation, I suppose. And I'd be interested in, in your comments. Right. Is, that, is, that, is that the way it works? Yes, we have uh, uh, broad-based uh, deliberative processes on, yeah. again, almost all the major policy issues, yeah. particularly when uh, uh, a, a major policy paper like the National Plan for Economic mm -hmm. and Social Development is concerned. So it's, uh, it's, uh, 
it's very often a year-long process with consultations taking place at different levels, collecting and soliciting the opinions mm -hmm. from different walks of life of the society. Uh, and uh, I think one of the key observations I like to share on uh, our version of democracy is that um, it has a, I think, a reasonably good uh, proven track record in terms of delivering results. And that's why I think it has uh, one The focus on delivery, base. you mean? Right, delivery, yeah, yes, results yes, and yes. results, yeah. So that's why it has uh, one broad-based support from the Chinese people. Yes. And I think um, support from the people is um, probably the most important source and measure of legitimacy for and any political system. And exactly, I mean, yeah. that's, that's a measure of democracy wherever it exists, isn't it, really? Yeah. The, 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 um, so yes, I've been to the Temple of Heaven as well. So mm. um, with that, that's a, a long-standing um, tradition inside China as well, isn't it? The, um, mm. the fact that if it's not working for the people, uh, mm. it's not working. Mm. Um, okay, so speaking of that, um, peaceful coexistence is mm. important for all of us too. And so what's China's approach to that and what's out of your history and, mm. and uh, some examples? I mean, it's been the, the um, recent um, uh, brokering the uh, res resumption of relations between Iran mm. and um, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia mm. I think, is is a, is a magnificent um, mm. a step towards peace. It appears mm. to me. So, mm. yes, what's what's China's um, and, and of course we uh, we're all awaiting what happens uh, with uh, Xi Jinping going to Russia next week. So, mm. um, can you yeah? What about China's approach to peaceful relations, mm. and particularly out of your history? Yeah. Again, it's uh, the paramount importance we attach mm. to peace as such mm. Mm. in and by itself uh, um, is an important part of our mm. values, yeah. uh, both traditionally and today. Um, because uh, not only peace is it's important by itself, but also it serves as um, the foundation uh, for development to take place. Mm -hmm. And we see uh, peace and development as the two o organizing and overarching themes for the world uh, today. But uh, unfortunately, our world is uh, not yet a very peaceful place. It has been haunted constantly uh, by uh, uh, the specter or even the scourge of war as such. Uh, and a major challenge, I think, is um, uh, for the international community today is how we could rise, we could rise above the differences that inevitably, inevitably exist between countries and settle uh, the disputes um, through uh, peaceful means mm -hmm. and create conditions to enable countries, including those with very different economic, social and political systems to coexist peacefully. Um, and China is um, is one of the earliest and inarguably the staunchest, staunchest advocates and, and practitioner uh, of uh, a peaceful coexistence. Uh, if you recall, um, back in the 1950s, uh, we, together with some other fellow members, <laughs> but early fellow for me. international, <laughs> yeah, the developing that country, we put old. forward the five principles. Oh, yes. A peaceful coexistence, yes. namely um, respect for sovereignty and yes. territory integrity, yes. non-aggression, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit, and finally, of course, a peaceful coexistence. And 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 carrying on that tradition, uh, a more recent example is um, uh, the uh, what we call the the global security initiative as proposed by President Xi Jinping, and uh, uh, which lays down the core concepts, uh, goals, and principles uh, for how uh, we as an international community could work together to eliminate the root causes of international conflicts and to bring about lasting peace and security in our world. 
uh, and and uh, some other concrete examples uh, would include what you have just mentioned, uh, our efforts to broker a deal between uh, uh, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia, uh, mm. which has been broadly welcomed by mm. uh, the international community, particularly those in the, uh, in, in the Middle East, as, mm. a, as a contribution to greater peace and stability in that region and in the wider world for that mm. reason. Mm. And uh, another example would be um, the, the the twelve point proposal for political settlement of the Ukrainian situation, mm. Um, mm. starting with some fundamental principles, but also some of the specific mm. steps we could take together, including the cessation of hostilities and 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 and, and the start of uh, serious uh, peace negotiations. Uh, and it also covers some other key issues uh, in well, relation I think that, to the situation. I think that's, uh, yeah. you know, I, I really, you know, would like to congratulate China on, mm. you know, bringing that issue of the, the war needs to stop because indeed. what's happening is indeed. too indeed. many people um, mm. are, are just being, uh, their lives are being destroyed, mm. they're being killed. It, it, it's right. time for it to stop. And I think, mm. uh, you know, so I think China's... Um, Initiative in that area does mm. does uh, definitely demonstrate mm. the, um, the commitment to peace mm. on China's part. S so, although there's there's no magic silver bullet no, no, that will no, solve the problem at one fell scoop. At, no, uh, but 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 if, if all of us could pull in the same yeah, direction but, but and create the necessary yeah, conditions yes, for negotiations I agree. to start, I think, I think I th yeah. Uh, there will be greater chance and and it's for important peace. that China yeah. as a major world mm. power is making that call mm. for uh, hostilities to, mm. hostilities to stop as a part of peace indeed well uh, one more thing perhaps mm. if we can is um, mm. the Congress report spoke of building a human community with a shared future and and I wonder I mean I think from what you've said as well, that China mm. has a view of what it can offer the world, mm. and and it's not it it's basically, uh, if I've understood you rightly, it's about uh, development for everybody. So mm. I wonder if you could just um, mm. expand on what what's mm. meant by that and what's mm. what's China see as its offer to the world, mm. so the or to the rest of the world. Right. The the proposition of uh, building the human community or global community with a shared future uh, was first uh, put forward by President Xi in 2017. Mm. And since uh, I think our thinking on this has evolved uh, so, so that it has become one of the organizing uh, concepts for how we see this world and how we conduct our foreign policy. Uh, it could be could be understood or interpreted at three levels. Uh, first, it is a description of the state of our world, the way uh, we are interconnected and interdependent. And second, it offers a solution to uh, some of the global challenges we face that would require global partnerships for collective uh, solutions um, like climate change like uh, pandemics uh, such as such as COVID. Uh, and third, it is also a vision of the kind of, we, kind of world we could uh, uh, build together as a family of nations, uh, a world of lasting peace, uh, sustainable development, and common prosperity. And under that umbrella uh, of this broad uh, proposition. Um, we have also put forward some uh, major specific initiatives, uh, the foremost of which uh, would be the Global Security Initiative, which mm -hmm. I've just discussed briefly, but also the Global uh, Development Initiative, uh, uh, which aims to promote a global sustainable development and common prosperity in alignment uh, with achieving uh, the United Nations uh, Security uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. 
Another major initiative in this connection would be uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, marks its 10th anniversary this year, um, because it was first launched by the President uh, in Kazakhstan and, and Indonesia back in 2013. And BRI, uh, or the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, has been uh, characterized as, uh, as uh, the biggest international public good uh, offered by China uh, to the world. And it's also described as the best vehicle uh, for advancing uh, towards building the global human community with the shared future. And the essence of the initiative is uh, both closer and stronger connectivity, um, uh, not only in the areas of in infrastructure, but also uh, in areas of trade and investment, in, in finance, and uh, more importantly, in people-to-people -people links. So the idea is that we, 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 we plan together, build together, and benefit together uh, so that we could uh, build a better and more closely connected, but also a, 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 a more prosperous world. Uh, and uh, since uh, uh, the initiative was, was launched 10 years ago, remarkable progress has been, has been made. And uh, uh, the, the implementation of the initiative has brought major, material, tangible benefits uh, to the countries involved. And to reflect on uh, the progress made, the lessons we could learn, and to plan for the next steps, we will host uh, the third uh, high-level forum for Belt and Road International Cooperation later this year, most probably in October. And that would be a, a major, I think, milestone for uh, uh, the evolution of this, uh, of this initiative as such. And hopefully uh, that will contribute to the wider course mm -hmm. of building uh, the global community of a shared future as well. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Ambassador Wong. Are, are there any other matters that we, you would like to mention that, we haven't, uh, that I haven't asked you about or you, you think would be... Um, People would be interested to know about China and its values. I think we've been we've been quite thorough in our discussions. But if I have anything to add, uh, because I'm ambassador here yeah. in New Zealand, uh, I would uh, say that uh, uh, we have just celebrated last year the 50th anniversary for our bilateral relationship. Uh, we've made enormous progress in those 50 years. But I would say with uh, uh, joint efforts on both sides, we would have much more to look forward to. Well, it, and on that note, this, uh, this photo that uh, I've put up uh, here is, uh, uh, shows um, Ambassador Joe Walding, sorry, Minister Joe Walding, Minister mm. of Overseas Trade in 1973, mm. visiting China. It was the first ministerial visit after the, um, the recognition of China in 1972. Mm meeting uh, Premier Zhou Enlai, mm. and you mentioned the five principles of peace, and I believe they are, they are dated from, uh, d d those, are, those are from Zhou Enlai, if I have it mm. right. Mm. And the uh, caption says, the day Zhou met Zhou, we o have opened the door and said hello. And so that's, the, that's I think, the start right. of what, what in, in, um, in my opinion, has right. been a very important relation Indeed. for both of us. For both, of, well, for, for New Zealand and, and and for both of us. So, so yeah. that was that visit took place in 1973, one yeah. year after the yeah. opening of yeah. the official relationship. Yeah. And back in 1972, I think our bilateral trade uh, stood at about seven million dollars. Seven the, million. Seven dollars. million dollars. What is it now? And last year. Uh, the last time I checked, uh, our bilateral trade stood at uh, 40 billion New Zealand yes, dollars. Yes. Well, yeah. th who, who would imagine that yes, uh, yes. in 50 years, 50 years' time yes. yeah, we could reach such heights? Okay, well, again, once again, uh, Ambassador, thank you very much for this interview, and we look forward to further discussions and communication. 
Again, thank you very much for the for the opportunity. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's a pleasure.